Welcome everyone to the Food Leader Series. Uh, today is October 1st, 2012, and uh, we're excited to be talking tonight about homesteading in the city with Jules Gervais and the Gervais family from Southern California. A little bit about myself. My name is Jason Matthias. I'm a husband and father of five, a lifelong gar gardener. I'm also from Southern California, uh, an Air Force veteran and an entrepreneur, and I'm the founder of True Food Solutions which is an online community uh, for real food enthusiasts. So whether you're a farmer or a homesteader, uh, a local food activist, or um, you know, you're just into healthy food and you're a foodie, uh, or you're a backyard gardener, any, anything that has to do with real food, we're an online community that's designed to provide you with a venue to uh, connect with other people, to find inspiration and education, uh, exchange ideas, and really try to provide through the features of the website um, some tools and help facilitate uh, asking questions and sharing answers with each other. There's discussion groups uh, for sharing ideas and uh, really we want to help people work together to develop and implement the real solutions to reform our food system that are so drastically needed. So we want to grow ideas together and that's why we're here. The webinar series, the Food Leader series is really designed to uh, bring in experts in various areas and share what they've learned and uh, provide some inspiration to the attendees and uh, to help grow uh, the membership of those who want to talk to each other and share what they're doing. So we appreciate you joining us tonight. We have a treat tonight. We're going to uh, be talking with the Dervais family from Pasadena, California. Uh, Jules Dervais is the dad and visionary of the, the clan, Justin. Uh, the son is the gardener, uh, beekeeper, and, and biodiesel producer. Um, uh, Anais is uh, the chef and the home manager, and Jordan is an animal lover. She takes care of all the, uh, the their micro farm and the webmaster, and they've, they've got other uh, folks in their team as well, but this is the core of their family, and it's really amazing when you hear their story about all they're able to do uh, with this crew. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jules. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Oh, thank you, Jason. Thanks for the invitation. All right. Well, why don't you uh, tell us your story and, and just uh, you know, share with us what your journey has looked like in this path to freedom of urban homesteading. Okay. I want to say hello to all the attendees. Uh, I have a lot of information. It's what I've developed over decades. I consider uh, this a journey of 40 years. So this is uh, where it starts. Um, there's a quote of mine on the board. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, we'd, we'd like to go back to the old ways. We figured that they had some uh, good information we've lost, a uh, good way of life living that we've lost. So we are on a journey here. And so these are, these are some of the elements of uh, modern homesteading uh, that I've uh, developed with my family. I have uh, three grown children living here on a, in a 1917 house in Pasadena, California. So we're we're um, all in this together. It takes a family, and we've just decided to put um, put the roots in the grassroots. And the first thing we would start with is uh, growing our own food. It just made sense uh, to do this. Uh, we were uh, desperate to find a solution to the GMO problems. Uh, I've always gardened, but I wanted to garden. Uh, uh, I guess for good, <laughs> for for real, for true, and, and and fully garden. So this also made plenty of sense uh, in terms of dollars because organic food was expensive out here for a family, growing family, and it also is, uh, we'll be able to protect our health better uh, when we grow our own food. So we're on a situation, location is important to us, uh, and the fact that uh, we're in the city, uh, one mile from uh, Colorado Boulevard and one mile from the Rose Bowl, but we're at the intersection of a, a freeway behind our house. There's the 210 and the 134, and the 210 off to the left there is uh, 11 lanes wide, and uh, our neighborhood was cut off by that inter interstate, and so our house is just a, a fifth of an acre. You can see that from... Uh, and it's a old, one of the oldest neighborhoods in Pasadena. Okay, so we have, we have uh, definitely um, no quick fix here. Uh, that's one of the lessons we learned. It will never be uh, anything that goes quick uh, that's good. Uh, usually nature is a, a slow mover, and that's fine with me. But um, 
we're in for the long haul. Uh, that's a, our first garden in 1985, and then uh, we progressed, and and we stopped here in 2004. It got it, you know we have more new um, pictures on the internet, but that's just a couple of the changes. Same same location. So what what I started out with uh, was to um, try to figure out if, if I was doing uh, well in gardening, <laughs> and and I hadn't uh, gardened in the city before, and I hadn't gardened in California before. So uh, we decided uh, to take a, a chart and measure our own progress. That was what we were determined to uh, to uh, see if we were getting it better. And there's there's the results. Uh, there's the result. So one. We average about 6,000 pounds of harvest. That's a breakdown of 60% uh, is for self-consumption, uh, and then we have done so well that we we can sell about 40% of our produce uh, to local markets here. And then uh, we also have some animals here that take up the rest of it. So these are the gar guarding methods uh, that we've used over the years. Uh, there's not one way we, we uh, uh, basically tend to we don't do anything one you know one thing we just do everything we can get our hands on that works so this is a a work of trial and error and you can read uh, our our uh, selection there on the right but one of the best things that I had going for me was that I take over my dad's uh, love of nature and uh, he had a style that we call jungle and uh, we this one is pretty mild here but we have some places that look like uh, you have to cut yourself out of there with a machete. <laughs> uh, while we're on this slide, Jules, can you tell us um, what are what are some of the because you have a whole bunch of uh, of different techniques here. Mm -hmm. What do you think have been some of the most beneficial combinations of of techniques or methods that you found? Obviously, you do a lot of um, vertical gardening because mm -hmm. of the size, the space constraints. What what kind of things have been What's have worked planning? well together? Well, definitely. Uh, Definitely, the soil was really bad here, so uh, raised raised beds have been the only way we can uh, do whatever. Uh, oh, definitely because of the small space, uh, we we uh, the advantage of of going vertical. That's the only way we can expand our our acreage, uh, you know, grow up. And uh, the rest of it is uh, trying to imitate. Even though we have to do some commercial stuff, uh, the rest of it you'll see maybe some other photos that'll be uh, imitating nature's uh, style where it grows. Um, Pretty wild and and pretty free flowing, and this part here of the yard is basically more commercial. The front yard is more uh, natural. Okay, all right. And you talked about the importance of uh, of building the soil, and so why don't you talk a little bit about that as we continue? Okay, well, definitely the soil was so bad that that we would um, uh, here it goes. Uh, we would restore it. Is the next slide. Uh, this this needed to be done. Uh, look at the before. We had a we call adobe soil. You could build a mission uh, like that. And once it dried up, it was like a rock, like a brick. And so we had to we had to at least uh, restore the soil to. After so many years, we got it to what we call charcoal gray, uh, and that's we're proud of that <laughs> transition. So there's your uh, ways that we do it, do that. We uh, definitely compost everything. We don't want to waste anything. But we've learned a lot about. Um, you know these uh, new things, uh, the mycorrhizae fungus, fungus that uh, that just come on uh, about uh, five years ago, I guess, I guess, and now they're in in soil mixes all over. So they're they're really 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 reinvigorating the soil with with a live. They consider now the soil alive, which is a shock <laughs> instead of dead. So mm -hmm. and so we're we're uh, trying to make the soil uh, grow the soil first, and and using uh, uh, we use our animal manure uh, for the next year's garden. So we have animals on the property. So those are those are eight eight ways that we enrich the soil. Why don't you go ahead and, and talk about how you uh, d how you use your biointensive uh, spacing and all that? Okay, our our slide is stuck. Here it goes. It's a little slow. I guess mm -hmm. it's hot, hot. Hot. I told you it was hot here. We had 105. <laughs> so the internet is going really slow here. So I'll try to anticipate it a little bit. But this is square inch. Uh, we we uh, we want to mimic nature. Uh, we want to grow things together. We not uh, we have that small space anyway. So this uh, this was our uh, reasoning behind it. But also it conserves water and it's uh, healthier plants. And um, we don't have to mulch it. Heavy, and we don't like the uh, spaces between plants to where the sun can beat down and 
and change things, uh, stress the plants out. So we, we have them basically touching. And that's what we call the square inch gardening. And so where am I next? So you're you were mentioning earlier about the front letting the front yard kind of go to okay. more of a wild state. Uh, these right. these pictures on. are pretty impressive. Right. Okay. So the front yard gets uh, gets a different treatment. We're in uh, a, a city of Pasadena, which has a, a very uh, high image to maintain. It's a uh, first class city. So uh, we we bought the house. It was a fixer upper in the redevelopment area in 1985, and uh, we uh, tried to um, uh, go slow and and see what would work. So we in 1992 we just had a, a rambling um, wild wildflower garden in the front, and then uh, now we've turned over to about 60 percent uh, perennials that that grow year after year, and then we just change out 40 percent. But it looks some people will drive by here and not know there's a house behind it. That's a little change since then, but it, uh, they won't even know there's a house on the property here. Mm -hmm. So then we call that liberating the front yard because in California uh, we have grass that don't doesn't belong here. <laughs> you know, it's mm -hmm. semi-arid here, so so uh, we, we remove the grass and, and try to make it productive. So when we water, we actually water uh, something for for use uh, for our family or we sell. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so then um, we also can't we didn't stop at just growing food uh, because that's just one aspect of, of uh, what we call path to freedom. So we went and, went ahead and, and um, looked into uh, using alternative energy sources. And here's our energy chart. Uh, we we um, kept kept records and found out that it in the year 2000 that we were going to go off the charts. Yeah. You know, it was gonna it was gonna continue if I didn't do something, and that I mean that just was uh, proof right there that I had to do I had to do a turnaround. So we got energy efficient appliances and kept stepping it down until 2004, where and in the year 2004 we got 12 solar panels, and now we're 100% green energy. 70% uh, is our own solar energy, and and 30% uh, is from a wind farm that we pay extra uh, to get to. To this place, and we're now 100% uh, green. Hmm. Tell us and, about some of the other ways that you you conserve energy. Okay, so what we have there is uh, uh, there's our panels. Uh, we we've, we've uh, gone our kitchen has gone to hand appliances. We use uh, just hand you know solar ovens on the outside. We built an earthen oven, which is uh, called a cob oven, uh, for outside cooking. It just takes uh, wood, uh, scrap wood, and then just for for fun to teach children. A different way, uh, on adults a different way. On your wheel? We have a, a pedal-powered uh, blender. Okay, what what this what this meant is that um, uh, one solution is not the answer. It's a, multi, a combination of all these solutions together. So, so growing food just got us uh, kick-started, and and it's still our main uh, you know way of living. But but we living here in the modern era, we had to find alternative fuels and transportation. So we we uh, when we go sold our goods to the restaurant, our produce to the restaurant, they had waste vegetable oil to uh, give away. So we, we make that, my son makes that into biodiesel fuel for our, bi for our diesel cars. Mm -hmm. And we're in the city so we can uh, take advantage of that and bike and use public transportation. That's great. How much, uh, how much biodiesel are you producing uh, each year? Oh, we do about 30 gallons a month. Okay. And is that that's enough for, for your, your vehicle transportation? Yes, uh, because again, we're in the city, and that's what's uh, advantage is our markets are local, mm -hmm. and our and our shopping is right here. So it was a way to, um, you know, get about without without, um, you know, if we had to develop a, a extensive transportation thing, we really have uh, our hands full just driving on these freeways. So we would mm -hmm. we're just glad to live in the, in the middle of a city, you know, instead right. of using the freeways. That's great. So, so the other thing was that we would do. Um, uh, look for other ways to grow food and 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 take care of our our business here. So we would uh, find a way to bring the country to the city. Uh, we always uh, want to go. We always want to go back to the country, and that's our dream. But the the fact is, we live in the city, and it's a it's going to be a hard move. So we brought we brought the country into the city, and one way to do that is my daughter asked for for pets. So we found pets that were um, useful. Uh, we have a chickens, ducks, and goats. Right there, and and bees, and they're uh, part of our our farm family here. 
and they give us eggs for um, for uh, our own use, uh, honey for our own use, and uh, and the ducks also uh, have duck eggs. So we're able to not only feed ourselves but uh, sell those extra to the to the city people here and the, and the na- our neighbors. And uh, there's our our barnyard menagerie of uh, animals. They're raised naturally out in the open, and they're uh, all together. It's like a little UN. But um, the bees are separate. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> In that photo, they're not going to go go together. And so, uh, one of one of the things that we found, uh, you know, in our lifestyle here is there's so much waste, and there has been so much waste for so long that that uh, we just hated to see uh, anything go that we could use, recycle. Or, uh, one of the things that we had to do was compost. We saw that before, and so we rarely leave anything and rarely leaves our property that we uh I mean we, we actually have to throw away you know so so we keep things uh, uh for for the future we uh, you know we uh, restore things remake things so we got a little collection of uh, old things that we can one day um you know fix up our place with but it's it's definitely uh worth it to to reduce our waste and we believe in treading lightly on the planet So how do you how do you grow so much uh, food in arid Southern California? Yeah, that's a challenge because we uh, last year we only had eight inches of rain, so uh, we have to conserve water. Uh, the wa- most of the water goes toward our garden, and um, so we're we're very conscious of that because we don't get it from the sky. So we do uh, we do have an outdoor shower. Uh, we do little tricks like there's a, a a toilet lid sink there that that you can wash your hands. That's another gray water usage. And then we have found this thing, uh, these um, the jars, uncla- unglazed uh, pottery that we call ollas, the name ollas, the Spanish name O-L-L-A-S. And they're the original drip irrigation system from way back, like 3,000 years ago, uh, that um, when you bury in the ground, they act as um, self, self-watering containers to the plants around it. So there's a, no waste and a, a very efficient way of conserving water. Wow, that's fantastic. So we are always looking for water solutions. So the the clay pots you mentioned, what were they called again? The uh, the Spanish o- name? Ollas, O L L A S. Okay. I think we're going to go show them right here in the next slide. Mm-hmm. It's coming on really slow for us. <laughs> so what we have is uh, back in um, we found them in China, uh, Rome, and Egypt. That you bury these pots in the ground up to the throat. And then uh, when you fill them with water, they weep out by us by uh, osmosis, by capillary action to this dry soil, and they deliver the water down to the root zone. Mm-hmm. So that's that's the irrigation that has a method that has saved us from drowning in, in debt for water. <laughs> it's just, mm-hmm. just water right on the spot. Uh, we use the outdoor solar shower a lot during the summer, and that that's another gray water uh, solution. And then uh, we reuse water. We uh, use the old-fashioned five-gallon bucket method of, of taking water when when my son uh, washes uh, the vegetables, and and we pack uh, salads for the market. Uh, the, the leftover water goes to the plants. So this is the uh, we don't want to do anything, but we we can't. Of course, we pray for rain, but we can't uh, ask in this climate to 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 get a rainy season. Uh, it's a it's a dry climate, so we, we our main challenge is to conserve water. Mm-hmm. So we're into also simple living. Okay, and uh, the simple living is a is a, uh, a a lifestyle change. Okay, which one is it? This one. And uh, not only you know do we grow food, but we we. Um, we uh, preserve it, can it, and and uh, we make our own, um, you know, from scratch food. And so that's and also what we can't grow, we buy from a, a co-op, so bulk storage. Mm-hmm. So this is just as part of the puzzle. It's a real, um, it's a complicated puzzle in the sense that uh, we see at least, uh, you know, something to do all, all the time that we haven't, we're not doing. So we always we got a challenge ahead of us. But we're we're looking at at uh, you know, uh, picking away at, the, at this. Uh, Problems and then eventually get a, a whole holistic, a real life solution you know, across the board. But mm-hmm. simple living is definitely essential. 
Right. So uh, the, the the food that you're not growing on site is is going to be, uh, and that you're buying. You mentioned through like a food co-op is uh, like bulk grains and other other things that you're not growing there on site, right? So um, yeah. how, how does that how does that work out? Is, is how much of your your food comes through um, outside sources versus you know what you're growing on on site? What does that split look like? Okay. Do I have a graph on that? Okay, not here yet, but um, what I would say is that we are 100% self-sufficient in terms of produce. Uh, um, uh, the hard thing is this, is uh, you know, green produce and everything that goes here. The hard thing is like staples. We'll never ever be able to get uh, beans and and rice and and uh, even corn. It's too it's too uh, that has to be field grown, and then also we need uh, we still need dairy and and uh, we still eat cheese. So what we do is we what we do grow here, we grow excess like heirloom tomatoes, uh, specialty crops. So when we have specialty crops that we sell to the chefs here and the caterers in the area, uh, that translates to cash, then we can go buy the stuff that we can't um, mm. grow here. So we consider ourselves 100% self-sufficient because this is where we live off of this land, but, but we can't grow it, but we grow enough that we can surplus that we can sell. So right. it's an indirect and a direct relationship. So it it adds up to that we're going to we're going to be uh, self sufficient here, uh, whatever it takes. But we're and we're almost there. The the main thing is we can't uh, do it all ourselves here, so we have to turn mm -hmm. some of it into cash. Right. So the the point being, uh, I just want to make sure people understand this is that you are um, taking the the land that you that God has given you, you're stewarding it and optimizing or maximizing the production such that you're you're producing an abundance uh, uh -huh. over what your own family can can use, and then you're trading essentially in this case you're selling and uh, through through uh, to local restaurants and, and that kind of thing. Uh, your excess, and then you're taking the uh, resources from that, translating it into those other food resources that you don't have locally. So uh, you're you're taking the land and having it be able to produce all of your food, but some of it, like you said, is indirect through other means. But you're able to to trade to to get to gain that. So you're you're self-sufficient in terms of producing the resources from the land, but you're interdependent in terms of how you're obtaining some parts of your uh, your food supply. Is that correct? That's good. That's correct. That's a good description. Uh, okay. I say we, we, you know, when you look at the size of the land, you look at and the size of the, some crops, and you need the needs of some. You know, that's why they have acreage you know, farms. Is mm -hmm. that well, we're on a we're on a fifth of an acre, so I, that's a really reduct. That's uh, twenty cents of an acre. So we're mm -hmm. we're um, uh, it's committed to growing crops that we can sell. Mm -hmm. Okay, eat when we eat it. That's fine, but we have enough to sell, and that gives us our cash income for things that we could never grow here, you know, period. <laughs> you know, right. It's, a, it's right. still a city, and we're not going to have any. So it's a kind of a cod, uh, yeah, okay. We have just a, you know, cottage industry here. Mm -hmm. that, right. Of, and, of and growing really, something to sell, yeah. Yeah, I think that's one of the greatest things about your story is that, um, you know, with that such a limited space, there's only so much that you can do. Like you said, you can't grow some things that require acreage that are field crops. But uh -huh. um, you, what you are doing is you're translating uh, by over by producing an abundance that you're translating into providing for the other needs you have. And I I think that this is is another example, probably the best example, but another example similar to one of our previous webinar guests, uh, the Roberts brothers from Texas, who on a fifth of an acre are doing market gardening in their uh, in their second year feeding 10 families uh, fresh produce. So uh, I, I want to kind of hammer on this point and just tr to try to provide it as a point of inspiration for people that you can do a lot even if you don't have very much space. And so you know, to give people the, the, the idea of what's possible, uh, this is what's possible. And I, I, I want to really uh, kind of um, kind of hold you up for the, what you've done, what you've developed, and, and how you're able to translate such a small space into so much productivity. It's really inspiring. Yeah. I think that's what, uh, why uh, this is a unique places because uh, people say, well, I didn't know you could do that. Uh, and mm -hmm. when I tell them I didn't either, you know, <laughs> so, mm -hmm. but right. I keep trying. Okay. So, yeah. so it's, it's always a uh, trial and error and, and we have to adapt and, and make it, uh, uh, this, we wanted, our goal was to be self-sufficient and we found ourselves here in the city and, and the people would love this food. I mean, tell you that when we sell this food, they said they've never tasted anything like it. So we're actually educating people at the same time. Because if they don't, they don't get a chance to get this.
from the, even from mm-hmm. the supermarkets, even organic, is that the right. same as fresh local? Right, right. When you have the combination of organic and really hyper local, especially because right. in your population density, you have restaurants that are probably blocks from you. Yes, and, um, and customers come by and they say, we, we pick it to them. We custom, customize. We have a farm stand, and we, mm-hmm. we customize. They call it, and we pick it that morning. They've just never seen anything like th- that in their, in their lives because mm-hmm. uh, in young people especially, they just, they, it's just foreign. Right. <laughs> you know, to them. right. Yeah, that's great. All right, well, tell us, tell us about uh, some more about you know, how you're taking this mindset of simple living and, um, and producing, uh, being a producer rather than just a consumer. Okay, one one of the things that that uh, the challenge for me is to to uh, I was college educated and uh, I thought I was bound for college uh, for corporation life and and traditional uh, you know jobs and everything and I had mm-hmm. to learn how to do it myself and I had to teach my children the same way so this was a uh, really saved us a bundle it also cost us a bundle <laughs> but, right. but you learn from your mistakes but now I have children that are really smart on on, on uh, this I had to be the the, I guess the guinea pig, but um, we can we can uh, basically repair most of our automobiles, and we we've uh, fixed the house. We even installed the solar ourselves. So this is money saving uh, mm-hmm. for us. This is the only way to do it is to be the old fashioned lifestyle where uh, a person was able to do most of not everything, but most of the stuff that you know keeps you going. Mm-hmm. There's still stuff I can't do, but and, no, and probably will never learn. But it, this is this is a of a heavier percentage than I've ever. My son has a better percentage going for him and do-it-yourself than I've had, and he's going mm-hmm. to teach more down the road. So this right. is a way to get out of out of a lot of a lot of a, a fix that we're in. Right, I agree. That's great. So in addition to to doing it yourself, uh, I think one thing your family exemplifies is really uh, a family that's working together. So tell, tell us about what that is like. Right. That, that's where it takes a family. You cannot do this. I can live by myself here, but there's there's only so much I can do. So mm-hmm. uh, farm families knew this way back when. I mean, every everybody that's lived uh, close to the earth knows that it's a it's a, the children are part of the the whole work experience here. So uh, we're we're working at home. Uh, we're doing uh, a lot ourselves, making the products to secondary products. So not only do we make you know our own little soaps and jams and things like that but we're also uh, developing a way to um to in- involve other people coming over here to say to, to you know my, my daughters cook for the people and they've just uh learned that, that uh cooking is something they really love so we're we're doing a little uh you know cooking there to to uh have people taste test our work so we're working it we're working at home here uh that's our own that's uh, it's tough but it's what we figured we we're going to do for the rest of our lives. Right. And then uh, the final uh, point here, I think, and this one is that almost final. So this was uh, in the process of, of uh, growing our own food and in the middle of the city. Uh, we thought it was just a, a matter of uh, us doing ourselves, but that's impossible. We're all in the same boat. So so we opened up uh, an educational outreach, and a lot of people have come through here on the Internet, and uh, we've got – uh, work that's all around the world, and we've been in countries, and we thought uh, the other countries would be, uh, you know, kind of uh, saying, well, what do, what do we need, you know, this kind of information for? But we're all in the same boat, and they all appreciate uh, going back to a a, a, uh, a neighborly way of life, uh, a people a people based lifestyle, mm-hmm. and nature nature uh, working with nature uh, gets you involved in in uh, community too. So it's uh, it's all about sharing and being a good neighbor, and that's. That's something I think um, that resulted from this journey was uh, mm-hmm. just to grow my own food. Uh, we also uh, grow a community. That's great. And I, I want to make the point that uh, uh, what you just described is, is largely uh, the primary thing that I'm trying to uh, enable online through True Food Solutions, which is uh, developing a online community that is a resource to people who maybe who maybe don't have in their local community people that have the know-how or the experience in certain areas and can can ask those questions and get answers. But I would I would caveat that by saying that you know an online community is a great thing. You can learn a lot on the internet, but reach out and be a good neighbor in your local community and develop your local. Uh, community relations and develop your local economy like you guys have done because that ultimately is what is going to um, matter in times of difficulty 
uh, in times of crisis, uh, like times like we're in today, uh, where you know the economy is not doing well, and you have to rely on people that are near you, because um, somebody that's halfway across the country can't necessarily help you with you know daily uh, things that you have need help with. So uh, I, it's great how you <laughs> yeah, it's great how you exemplify that, and I just uh, I want to commend you for that. So uh, I think here's the uh, the one you were mentioning earlier about uh, the stats uh, of what you what things you've produced on the on the homestead. That just gives you some idea of what we've been able to do. Um, the harvest is um, up and down, but we're still we're still all plugging away at that. But it just shows that in a small space, uh, things can happen if uh, if you are um, in it for the long haul and long term. It's not a it's not a quick one. It's a long one, and and you get better by by uh, learning as you go. Not you're not going to get it all from textbooks. You're not going to get uh, even from tips from your neighbors it has to be in your what you learn yourself so it's a do-it-yourself uh, pro project uh, project and we've been able to get some some uh, way down the road with that that's great this is, these are pretty amazing uh, numbers on uh, you know the solar power uh, produced uh, the biodiesel uh, production and then uh, you know obviously the the number that makes people uh, you know, hard to believe. Uh, yeah. It's three tons of of produce on that that small of a space. So, uh, and and then also that you know you're able to to combine uh, animal uh, husbandry and and animal product production in there as well. It's just uh, fantastic. Um, the the preservation I think is also another really important thing. A lot of people that are backyard gardeners. Um, I, I know there's a good number of people that garden for fresh produce but don't necessarily preserve the harvest. And I think that's one of the old kind of uh, lost skills that it needs to be restored. And it's good to see that you make that an integral part of what you do, so that your production during your you know your peak growing season is is preserved for your off season. Although, coming from Southern California, I know that the off season is very short there. You can grow about what 10 months a year there, uh, yes. if not more. So that that helps. <laughs> yes, that's why we want to make an effort to preserve because uh, we know that's important if the weather changes that. That you do carry over some of your produce, and, mm -hmm. and so that's a special thing that we do. Plus, uh, people have asked it of, of us because they get they get our preserves or get our uh, jams and stuff, mm -hmm. and that's a way of introducing them to this old way. It's an right. Education. Yeah. Right. And, and that's part of uh, an integral part of your cottage industry uh, that your family is is producing is um, making. Um, the 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 productivity of the land uh, available in times you know after the harvest beyond the harvest so that's yeah. fantastic. Well, um, your research pa resource page here. Um, I'll have this up again later, and we'll have all of these links on the um, uh, the the resource page online uh, that we'll share with everyone. So I don't feel like you have to copy all these down right now. But um, just tell us a little bit about each one of these. Um, websites and um, some of them you didn't really talk about during the uh, the presentation. So just just give us a brief intro to what each of these are and and uh, you know what people should look for on those particular uh, websites. Okay, uh, Urban Homestead would be our main site uh, that would have everything uh, that we talked about uh, as a journey. We just uh, archive it or put a whole bunch of stuff up there. It's just a the, the the mother site, <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Little homestead in the city would be a blog that we would uh, we like. My daughter liked the name because she uh, grew up on on uh, little home in the little house in the prairies on the mm -hmm. prairie, whatever. So she did that. Um, she does that. And Homegrown Revolution is a film that we made. Uh, you can see more video, uh, especially the backyard and walk have a walk through of the garden. And uh, we had to start a store to supply us. Not only ourselves, but we people ask us what, where we get this, where we get that, and we decide what well, we, we better carry something. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it, it provides us with uh, income to do our outreach because our outreach is now almost uh, more than 50% of our day mm -hmm. uh, is an is an educational outreach. There's, we have three computers in this room, and and my daughters just continually uh, feed the computer here to to help people around the world with um, the back and forth interaction on the internet. Mm -hmm. And then urban homesteading, you got to tell us. That's a network of all the things. So, uh, and because uh, I'm still old-fashioned, I don't know how to do this stuff. So my daughters do this Facebook and this Twitter thing too. <laughs> That's great. Well, you you've got a, a d devoted following from what I've seen, and uh, you know we're, we're we're happy to have you 
join us and share what you're, you're doing and, uh, and to you know, help you grow uh, awareness of, of what you're doing. And cause I really think that there's, there's a lot, like we mentioned earlier, there's a lot of people that don't know what's possible. And it's, right. it's great to see uh, with your eyes. And that's one of the great things the Internet does is through pictures. And, um, and you've done a particularly good job, I think, also of you know, doing the, putting the stats up and the graphs and charts of, of actually what you've been able to do and, and showing those accomplishments I think really gives inspiration uh, and motivation to people to, to get out there and try, uh, try it even if they have only a small space to work with. So I appreciate that. Yeah, thanks. If they like video, we have a YouTube.com uh, urban homestead uh, mm -hmm. section and you can see you know all all of that we do we put we try to put as much um on YouTube as possible so that's another great avenue great. well like i said uh, we'll we'll include each of these uh on the the webinar uh, resource page um which i just want to make sure everybody knows where to get to that the page that you registered for the webinar uh to get the login information um if you just go to truefoodsolutions.com and click on the webinars link um, there will be a listing of all the webinars. If you click on uh, the link for the particular webinar you're interested in, that will take you to the resource page for that webinar. Each uh, resource page will have um, in uh, the page itself, um, when you're logged into the site, you'll be able to see that the video from the, the webinar. And uh, below that, there will have all the resources that were mentioned in the webinar. So um, the uh, websites that were mentioned today, uh, Facebook and Twitter and, and YouTube, uh, and then um, you know, if there's uh, any books or anything that, that are mentioned, those can be listed as well. There are uh, webinars we've had in the past, as you can see here. Books have been mentioned as good resources, so we list those as well so that people can have access to those. Uh, I'd also encourage you to, um, when you go to that page, go ahead and leave comments on that page uh, and ask questions about uh, anything that you saw there. Uh, we'd be happy to um, you know, have some interaction on those pages as well and feedback as well about what, what could, be, could be better or uh, if there's anything that you're still looking for, maybe we didn't cover in a particular webinar, we can look for those in future, uh, future installments. Um, also, want to encourage everybody if, if you haven't already to join the community on True Food Solutions. Uh, if you go to the homepage, you can click on. Um, if you don't already have an account, click on the register link, and that'll get you signed up on the website. Uh, it is a uh, an interactive uh, social networking type web website. You uh, create a profile, and you can put information about yourself and what you're doing there, so that uh, you can network with other like-minded people there. Uh, we have groups on the website that are. Uh, by subject or topic, like such as homesteading, um, gardening, um, local food. There's a, a one group on food preservation, uh, one on nutrition. So uh, feel free to join the groups that you're interested in and interact with people there. Uh, post the links to uh, articles that you find, ask questions, and start discussions about, about things that interest you. And if there's something that um, an area that kind of we the current groups don't cover, let us know, and we'll we'll look at creating a, a new one. Really, the, these are just a way for people to focus on particular interests and interact with others that are also interested in those topics. We've also got a questions and answers section which allows you to ask a question. Uh, and these are best for questions that are um, challenges you're facing with your gardening or maybe if you're um, you know, starting to raise animals, um, asking questions about you know, I'm having this problem. How do I how do I deal with this type of pest? Or, uh, you know, how what should I look for when I'm looking at buying farmland or something like that? And then the, uh, the the community members can not only answer but also vote on the answers, and that helps provide uh, kind of a ranking for the the answers that are that are given as to what kind of is the, the most helpful. Uh, responses and over time, this uh, grows a database of, of questions and answers that not only help the members but also help those who um, maybe Google is searching for something uh, online to find the community and, and plug in and be able to, to join and contribute to it as well. Uh, and then finally, we have lots of great opportunities to connect. You can share uh, what you're doing and links to other good info, like I mentioned. Um, you can connect other people there. If anybody is interested in blogging uh, about what you're doing, uh, I've got already several people that are starting to blog about um, they're starting a garden. Some people are starting a homestead or farming, and they're kind of just they want to kind of write about their journey 
um, we're happy to provide you uh, either in a guest post capacity where you post you know, for the, a blog post on our main blog, or if you want to have your own dedicated blog, we can set you up with one of those as well. Um, just email, uh, email me. Uh, you can reply to any of the emails we sent out. And let me know if you're interested in that, and we'll get you set up. We want to be a resource to provide uh, an avenue for people to share what they're doing and, um, and help others learn uh, through, through what you're learning. Before we get into the Q&A, I just want to again uh, thank uh, uh, Jules Gervais and, and his family for joining us tonight and sharing about their journey. Uh, we really appreciate your time, sir. Thank you so much for, for sharing what you're doing. And um, we'll get into the, uh, the Q&A here now. So if you have any questions, go ahead and type those in the chat box. And uh, I'm going to start by, I saw one or two questions already that were mentioned during the presentation. Uh, one of them was how to build the soil. If you can maybe give some of your best techniques for, uh, you know, what, what's the, if you have if you have poor soil, what, what, what's the kind of the steps to go about uh, improving the soil? Okay, when a long time ago when we started, uh, there was uh, we had to get started. So that had to be uh, going to a, a nursery that sold um, uh, bag soil, you know, and we we had to look for the uh, good stuff, you know, the organic stuff. And there wasn't that much of it, so but we had to start someplace. So we put we put um, bag soil in these. Uh, uh, eventually, it was just two by fours on the ground, and and that can grow at least a little bit of uh, salad greens. So we had it was just an attempt to start something. It wasn't it wasn't going to be good. You don't if you can wait you can wait for the best circumstances, <laughs> but it was something that we had to do right then and and then. Uh, and there, and so we we did have to go to uh, local nurseries get the bag soil. But now there's a lot of it out there. There's organic soil everywhere uh, that come along a long way. But when we started, it was just uh, importing soil, and mm -hmm. and we we did it uh, whenever we when I ever had spare twenty dollars, I'd go get five bags of soil, and and uh, they grew they grew a little bit of salad, and then then uh, or or pots. We bought pots and put. Uh, Potting soil in pots, and we grew we grew out of just pots, plastic pots. But then, as the soil um, produced more, then we had compost. So the compost, we would never throw that good stuff away. So we would just uh, put it in. I think one time we had like ten different ways to compost the soil. But the best best and tried and true way for us uh, gardeners is just let nature handle it in a in a um, cinder block or, or uh, we use. Uh, pallets to uh, hold the soil, hold the, the, the refuse, hold the waste until it turned into soil. So we've got a couple of those in the back. And every year it produces uh, um, maybe a, cub, you know, a couple of cubic feet of yard, uh, cubic yard, sorry, of, of soil. So that's, that now is, is once you start a garden, you'll have plenty to go back in the compost. Then our, our biggest change was to uh, get uh, farm animals. And uh, not only were, are they a, a treat and, and a and they're um, a blessing for my my daughters and uh, to uh, play with their pets, but they they are instant composters, and they they um, they take the refuge food and they'll turn them into soil. And uh, twice a twice a year, we muck out their pet their their um, living compound, their living area, uh, playing area, and pooping area. <laughs> we we uh, uh, get that uh, right out of the out of the uh, what they've turned into compost by scratching it and and uh, we, we throw the food in, and they mix it up. And t uh, twice a year, we'll we'll muck it out, and that'll go into the beds for next year's garden. So we have enough now that we're uh, we're uh, at a crisis of having too much soil, too much uh, soil left over, because uh, we're we've been uh, adding more to the soil. That we're uh, our next door neighbor, we're 18 inches higher. In uh, we're looking. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we built up the soil so much that we're looking down on our neighbors <laughs> because uh, we've got that much soil put back. Mm -hmm. Now, now it's turned into now it's turned into some uh, decent kind of soil. I wish I'd started with, but it's charcoal and it's and it's uh, a little bit got a little bit of uh, heft to it, and and it's starting to hold some water. So it's just a matter of putting back in. Do not, uh, you know, always put back in. We started even um, a long time ago was just digging a hole in the ground and and putting compost in the ground. Uh, we just would not let it go. That was that was that was tomorrow's gar uh, future. That was our garden. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I still might go out and pu purchase some amendments. Mm -hmm. You know, if I if I'm, I'm running short and we and we do have to replenish our our pots, so we go out and get organic potting soil. When the potting soil is finished and spent, 
well, it just goes, it goes, uh, uh, spreads around the garden. So the soil is, is the key. It, uh, do not, uh, can't go anywhere without that soil. So we, we make a lot of it ourselves and buy, buy a little bit extra if we, if, uh, and we need it because we're intensively growing. So it's just, it's just uh, over time, that's what you're looking at is uh, if you don't have a lot of money, you just have, you have to have put a lot of time in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you ever uh, raised rabbits by any chance? Yeah, we did, and, um, and we made a mistake of raising them outdoors uh, here in Southern California. And uh, somehow whenever they got injured or, or uh, had some sort of a problem, the fly strike got them. And it was so traumatic that my, we we never raised them again outdoors. Now we had, do have a rabbit inside just for for um, um, petting, but it's not it's not a uh, it's not any kind of we weren't going to have use them as meat source. But we were ju- we just thought it would it would add to the whole holistic yeah. idea of, of having rabbits because they would eat they would eat the uh, your uh, your waste uh, of gar- your garden waste, and then they would again add to the the mix of of compost. Right, right. We, uh, I believe that rabbits are actually one of the, um, the, the of all the, the kind of domestic, uh, you know, small space confined animals. They That's they it. can basically survive uh, almost completely without any feed supplement. They can just live yeah. on greens. So that's a fantastic idea, especially with weeds. You can always yeah, feed, them your, feed them your weeds. That's right. I mean, they're, that's a, they're a natural uh, consumer of weeds, and they, and they live uh, all by themselves. So this, this was our thinking, but, but the, um, it, couldn't, it just didn't work because this, this um, uh, I think it's a green fly that lays eggs in, the, mm-hmm. in any kind of wounds, and, it, and, and, it was, and their fur prevented them from discovering it. It was just pretty bad. So we, just, mm-hmm. we, got, we got one in the house, but it's not main to our homestead, you know. Mm-hmm. That's great. Um, someone asked, uh, since we're talking about animals, um, do you all locally have uh, permits required for those animals, or is it not regulated in your... Well, the, 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 yeah, the, beaut- the beautiful thing here was we settled in, uh, we, in the city of Pasadena, which is 125 years old, and when we started asking questions, you know, nobody ever thought when we when we started here, no, we didn't have any any idea there was anybody else doing it. So we checked with the code, and to our surprise, uh, people lived like this 125 years ago. <laughs> you know, shocking. This is how they lived. And Pasadena wrote in codes for everything but swine. They mm-hmm. they prevented swine from coming in their backyards. And then it reminded me that when we first moved in here 25 years ago, there was. Uh, Three doors down, there was somebody with chickens in their front yard and roosters, and this is um, the way people lived, and they had left it behind for gentrification, and now uh, if it's still on the books. Nobody thought to uh, to uh, change the books, so we're 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 fit. Uh, we fit right in with uh, with Pasadena. They have they have uh, you know limits, uh, space limits, and like I think we're allowed 14 fowl, uh, and they they have. Uh, you know, no. I think there's like uh, limits on the no no male uh, goats. I think it is no roosters. So so um, we fit in, and and uh, if you one one thing you want to do is just be a good neighbor, even if you fit in. You just we made sure a, a neighbor uh, lived next to us for eight years, and she didn't even know we had uh, animals here. So we make it uh, we do it religiously that we clean up, we clean, we clean, uh, uh, take care of the fly problem, take care of the odor problem. And when people come here and they can sit around in our backyard, they don't even know animals are there. It's so pretty that they that they they think it's a, a you know decorated. We call it uh, Rodeo Drive uh, chicken coop, you know, <laughs> because it's so it so fits in the city. It would never look like a uh, a chicken. It would never give somebody the idea that the property values have gone down. So what we're very conscious because of the backlash when people let things go uh, to the point that they the neighbors were worried that their property values are going down. So we made it a point to uh, every time I do something, I say, "Would I like to live next to me?" That's the true code. Mm-hmm. Uh, even if I had the, pr- the city permission, uh, I still want to make the neighbors happy. So right. they they see our place and they're so taken with it that that uh, a couple of people have to be married on the <laughs> our place. So we said we said that's fine, but we're too small. Thank you very much, mm-hmm. but we we have to be good neighbors, and that's the main mm-hmm. thing. Right, and that's great. The square inch gardening method, as you call it, I'm taking as a uh, um, extended case of the popular square foot gardening method. Um, somebody asked if there's a problem 
uh, with different plants' root syst uh, systems competing with each other when they're that close together? And there, are there any guidelines for plant combinations, uh, when you, especially when you have really, really tight spacing like that? Can you give us your, your wisdom on that? Oh, I, th I think I missed the first part of that, but um, are you talking about how close I'm growing things? Yeah, yeah. To, uh, basically, two-part question. One is, is there a problem with with different plants competing with each other in terms of right. the root systems and the, the tight space? And then also, as far as companion planting or um, you know bad combinations, how do you uh, deal with that? Because in such a small general area, you m you must have some challenges with with sure. how you situate the plants. Right. That that's ongoing. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the deal is. Um, the plants are keep changing, and and uh, I haven't been here long enough. If I if I had uh, inherited this place, I would have seen uh, you know if, uh, this is, this is a 1917 house. I would have seen uh, almost 100 years of growth here. Mm -hmm. But but uh, uh, we changed it dra drastically, and it's still changing. So it becomes a uh, a yearly problem to see what mm -hmm. can what needs to be taken out. So we we're making decisions. Uh, this has grown too big. Uh, there's too much shade. We have to we have to eliminate something. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we try to we try um, smaller plants, um, more compact plants, and and we uh, kind of mimic a, a forest, so that so uh, we would have tall plants, medium plants, and and uh, understory plants, and that's mm -hmm. that's the the mimicking of nature how they can grow so much in a small small space. Uh, nature has st the plants have their own uh, strata, I guess you know, and and, right. and that's a, that's something you have to you have to actually uh, uh, in, involve yourself in it directly. It's, I don't know if there's anything I could teach people, because even this this lot, if it was across the street, would be just 60 feet across the street. There would be completely different. I would have a completely different uh, landscape. It, it has to do particularly with uh, you observing your house and and seeing how much you can get away with. We've we've overplanted. Uh, I don't think we've ever underplanted, but we've <laughs> overplanted, and then we have to scale back, saying. Uh, that was too too dense, mm -hmm. and nature nature teaches you uh, when you've uh, overstepped the bounds. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, it's li listening to nature. Like I, I don't know what it, the bounds are, uh, and so I I am I'm experimental. I'm innovative. So I push the envelope, and then uh, nature will tell me you you went too far, and then I've got to I've got to adjust next year, and and that that goes on all the time. Mm -hmm. So that's why I almost I can't even say it because I'm uh, what I'm what I'm learning because every year. This could be different, and is different next year. So I'll, I'll be, re, uh, you know, changing some stuff that already that I see is too is not working. Mm -hmm. But uh, definitely get different. The, what what we have here is we have over 400 types of varieties in a year of growing uh, all the different varieties we grow, and so diversity is the only way to operate. If you're doing anything, these plants can fit together. It's just that you don't you don't um, you know grow one one thing all all over. You you uh, mix and match. And that again is a uh, some plants will won't uh, it won't will you know expand their space and then they won't let anything grow. Well, then I have to make that decision: do I want this plant or do I want smaller um, plants, uh, several smaller plants, or I want this huge plant? We had one plant that grew uh, 125 feet across the back fence, along the side fence. Um, we have a 132 foot long fence, and it went started and it, and it started going to the end of the fence, and it was so great. To have something grow so well, but it ate everything else up. <laughs> so I said, I said that was too well. So then I had to eliminate. I said I don't want to just have that one thing. I'd rather have, you know, uh, six or eight different plants rather than that one monster plant. So I've I've had to get rid of my own monster plants that grow that grew so well that that it, it uh, that's all I would have. So that's, mm -hmm. it's a it's always a choice. It's a difficult choice sometimes. Oh, that's great. What is your typical planting space uh, spacing for most plants? Oh yeah, see that that would be like uh, lettuce is really close. We try to do lettuce really close, and then um, then what I do is I picture a uh, a full size plant, mm -hmm. uh, like a, like a, we would fix, picture a full size tomato plant, and I would make sure that it would fit when it was fully grown, and then I would try to grow the other one so that they would just barely touch. You know, it depends on how big your plants grow. Now sometimes we get. Uh, Plants that grow uh, even year to year, they change. But one time we had eight foot tomato plants, so they they grew out of their they grew out of their predicted space. So then we then but it, just try to imagine full grown plant and then just uh, separate them by that that distance between the two mm -hmm. so that they barely touch. 
Right. Okay. That's I mean, great. it works with the different sizes. That's. I mean, you'd have to. Uh, pepper's a little bit smaller, and uh, then uh, you know you can also get dwarf. You can get smaller things, and mm-hmm. and then of course uh, our smallest thing would be like radishes or something. They they can go in there quite dense. Right. So radish like, like mm-hmm. an inch to two inches. Yeah. Right. Real tight. That's and then and then it also okay. Let me one more thing. It also depends on your weather. Uh, one time one time it really shocked me because. I, I had grown these plants like this for a long time, and one year they just totally um, went went bad on me, and it was the rainy year. My my climate uh, requires that that allows me to grow uh, close together. When if you have a rainy climate, you have to separate it because you need you need aeration, otherwise mold grows. But since we have a dry climate, uh, I don't need. Uh, I thought I had I didn't need aeration until the one year that it rained. <laughs> then then I needed. Then I had to back off. Mm-hmm. You see, that year was different because they were they were molding then because it was too close. Right. So you had to do a lot of pruning, especially I'm guessing with your tomatoes and things to prevent yeah, light. Yeah, I had to change it right to let in the light. Whereas right. uh, usually I'm trying to keep out the light. Mm-hmm. So there, that one year I had to completely do it reverse. Mm-hmm. Right. Which I think points to the uh, you know the perpetual challenge in gardening is always, exactly. always watching and listening and and trying to figure out what's going on and and taking appropriate action. Exactly. Yeah, as you have to be on the job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, you, and one thing you think is, uh, I say this, is that uh, when I learned to hit a, a fastball from nature, uh, nature threw me a curve. And then when I finally adapted and learned to hit the curve, they threw me a changeup. <laughs> and, now I'm, now, and sometimes I just strike and swing and strike out. But that's the thing. I'm, I'm just learning. I'm, I'm a student. Sure. I am uh, for, I'm forever will be a student. I think there's a lot of curiosity uh, about your your uh, in the city animal uh, animal uh, flock. Um, somebody asked about goats. Uh, how many do you have, and uh, what are you using them for? Um, are you using any for meat, or is it just for for milk? What's the uh, how do you how do you utilize the animals? Okay, the, yeah. Well, the the goats were were um, a uh, concession for the future. Uh, we couldn't wait to. Um, to do all the things that we had to do, so they were they were they were basically gotten here to to learn about goats. Mm-hmm. Um, my daughter is actually now becoming a, a holistic veteran, a veterinarian, sorry, and she's a veteran and becoming a, a veterinarian, uh, taking care of the goats. She wants to do this uh, more, but the 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 deal is that we don't have the space, and it, we always are c- conscious of the, uh, are the animals really happy in in uh, city city spaces. And so we we uh, we got this the small smallest variety and two is all we can uh, manage and two females so uh, they really need um, to be uh, um, mated and and uh, so so they can lactate and have mm-hmm. so they can have ch- kids and lactate and then we would be in the milk in the in the cheese business but right now it's just uh, one step at a time and the first step was just to get it, get them and learn about them so they're right. just uh, they're. Uh, for her, their replacement because uh, dogs wouldn't fit here in this type of place. They're kind of her her pet dogs almost. You know, because right. she she goes for a walk walk with them and and she sits by and and uh, they they you know kind of commune together. So they're good dog. You know, they're good uh, animals for people, but they're they haven't turned uh, we haven't turned that corner yet. Mm-hmm. But oh yeah, uh, talking about the city. Um, we're as fortunate that we don't have any neighbors, and the school that surrounds us on that prop- on that picture you saw, the school mm-hmm. has sort of adopted their uh, our 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 farm as their science science lab, and they wrote to the city asking for an exemption for the goats because uh, we we wouldn't fit here. But the school being uh, a school lot, there's no neighbors on that side, so they they asked for an exemption. But there are, our chickens and ducks are are fitting in the city, but it's just the goats that we needed. Uh, a special consideration. Mm-hmm. Great. The uh, I want to just do a head, go back to, to a minute. We're talking about composting. I forgot to ask earlier. You mentioned um, in your slide we were talking about uh, building the soil vermicomposting. How much vermicomposting have you done, and what are your thoughts on that? Well, that's it's, it's necessary, but it's it's really t- tough to keep it going for us. Uh, we've had um, we've had several tries at it, so if, if one know it failed uh, miserably sometimes, uh, you know we tried all the other uh, the kits, the, you know the cans and the boxes and stuff, and we went, we just went down to an old fashioned um, uh, wooden box. And the, the trouble with that is the ant, you know we're here uh, we've got imported ants, and 
uh, Argentina ants, and they, they um, you have to always watch the ant problem, and you have to watch the moisture problem, whether it's too too little or too much. So it is not uh, as much as we want a part of our lives. We'd like it have bigger space and a better situation. But we do have some. We've even sold some worms, but we're not happy with it. It's mm-hmm. just it's just uh, it's something that we want to do uh, and actually want to do it, um, you know, all over. But right now they're just in a in a like a, a two by four, two foot by four foot box, mm-hmm. uh, 18 inches high, and we feed them uh, scraps and stuff. But they're not. It's not like our our main thing. So that's kind of a sideline. Right. So so you're 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 doing um, more traditional composting as your main compost, but then you right. have a small kind of a a smaller um, experimental almost uh, right. worm worm composting station where you're yeah, that, you're doing yeah, that. that. Yeah, I would say the wor- worms couldn't take care of all our compost. Mm-hmm. So we give them, like, specialty stuff, like maybe we'll throw in some old newspaper or some mm-hmm. old bedding. But mm-hmm. the, the, we got so much uh, material that, you know, that it would, I think it would cook, the, you know, it would be really bad for the worms. You've got to give it to them mm-hmm. a little at a time. So uh, we've just gone to, you know, a, a more volume. Mm-hmm. And they're a smaller, a smaller aspect of it, but they're vital. I just wish I had, I wish I had a better situation for that. Sure. Um, we've got quite a few questions uh, relating to some of your alternative uh, energy and alternative um, uh, tooling and that kind of thing. Uh, one person asked how much time it takes each month to process the biodiesel. What, what's the cost there in terms of labor? Well, it's good if you have a, 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 fa- a son that loves to do it. <laughs> <You> <laughs> but I would say it's only um, it's actually um, uh, about 30 hours to get it. Uh, made from scratch from a uh, waste vegetable oil in a processor that that's um, rigged up here uh, br- like it brews it for 30 hours but mm-hmm. the the human human uh, time involved is only about three mm-hmm. it's like three hours of human labor the rest is settling and mixing it's on the timer and heating and mixing and and just settling out so it's not it's not um, time consuming in terms of um, uh, you know, uh, he can do it. My son can do it in the, in his spare time, really, for three right. hours. But it, it just you have to get to it. Like it on, it's mm-hmm. on a schedule. When you, it has, to, you have to be there, and so that's that's something. But uh, thirty three, uh, it takes about thirty hours, and we get thirty gallons, and we pay about a, uh, about a dollar a gallon. And that that dollar is for um, the uh, chemicals that are used to uh, make the reaction because it's a fuel. It's an mm-hmm. EPA fuel. It's not it's not a waste oil anymore because we have to pay a dollar for chem, for the chemicals to to work the formula, and then um, then we're um, um, basically uh, for, you know we have our own filling station then for just about a dollar a gallon, and it goes into a diesel our diesel cars, and then uh, I guess in, in that a dollar would be some electricity you know the electric mm-hmm. cost of the electricity, sure just to to heat it and to uh, mix it, right. That's great. So a uh, dollar gallon versus what? What's gas out now out there? Like five. Five. Yeah. Well, di- diesel is ridiculous. Diesel is a junk fuel, and, it gets, and I think it's what is it? Diesel go for four four fifty four fifty a yeah. gallon. And so that's like what? <laughs> you know, crazy. But yeah, we don't do we don't do gasoline cars. We have all diesels, and um, and so we can. Uh, the deal is to get waste vegetable. That's our biggest um, you know thing that we feel that we did something for the future. The the oil doesn't doesn't get to waste. It's already been used. It's it's uh, now trash, mm-hmm. and we turn it into a you know a treasure of fuel fuel for our cars. Right, that's fantastic. I've had several friends in the past that have done the same thing, and uh, I think that the challenge um, often with that that whole project, uh, it, your situation helps being in the city is that you have lots of um, uh, supply, steady stream of supply of mm-hmm. that that you know quote unquote waste oil. Exactly. Um, which is if you live in a less dense populated area, sometimes there, there may only be like one or two restaurants in the, in the area that, that have it, and it's going to be more and more popular. So unless you're on the ground floor and already have a supplier uh, set up, it may be difficult to uh, to go yeah, that route, but that's great that you're yeah, that's able right. to that's, do that. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why City works for us is that uh, – I mean, Pasadena and Southern California, restaurants everywhere, <laughs> you know, so you, you don't have any, mm-hmm. and they, in America, frying food everywhere, <laughs> you know, just, we don't exactly eat raw stuff, so, they, so there's a lot of fried stuff out there, mm-hmm. so any, any place you can fry in, you can get, you can get waste vegetable. 
Okay. Someone uh, was curious about the uh, your wood stove uh, or the cob oven. Um, in particular, how do you uh, source the wood, and then do you trade for that, or, or how, what's your situation there, and how do you make that happen in the city? Well, uh, originally we would get um, there would be some project in the in the area, um, maybe a house going up or renovation, and they would they would toss out lots of scrap. I mean, it was like waste. They would bring in a big uh, big bin, and and it would be full of uh, uh, offcuts. So it was like, wow, you know, you're you're throwing away that, you know. So we would pick up offcuts, uh, bring them home in a in a in a bucket, and and uh, that would be something. And then then every once in a while we would have uh, renovation projects, and we we you know you can't always get the lumber cut. To, to, we have the uh, you know the same problem. We have so much extra wood. Even building the beds, we would um, our, our raised beds. We would have extra uh, things. Never earn you know it never equalized right off the you know no no waste. So we had waste there. And then eventually um, um, we would buy uh, – we had this recently um, run out of those kind of things. So we, so we got a cord of wood uh, from uh, uh, people that sell wood for, for heating. We, we got a cord of wood that, that has uh, you know, stabilized our supply. Uh, and we could even, if, if we wanted to, go out. There's some woods nearby. We could even harvest our own. Um, when the kids were younger, that's how we, uh, I took them out there, and we would bring home uh, – you know, good stuff to use. But uh, right now, we we took a little bit uh, an easy way, and we bought a cord of wood, or half cord of wood, and that's what we have um, to heat our house and also to to uh, to do the oven with. Mm -hmm. What kind of uh, uses do you use that that outdoor oven for? It's for baking bread, or what what other things are you using it for? Well, it, uh, it was originally like a a project for for how how you can do things differently and. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a lot of outdoor. Uh, uh, Southern California has a lot of outdoor barbecues, and we wanted to show that you can you can do it the old-fashioned way. And and uh, so it was an experiment, and we did use it for a while. Now it's kind of uh, gone off use because uh, we've been busy and we don't have as many uh, parties outside. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, recently we've had been contacted with a baker, and he wanted to see if he can he, he can use it to bake some uh, bread the old-fashioned way. Mm -hmm. And we said sure that that. Would, we're we're so busy that we now don't have to worry about uh, which which project we have so many projects to go that we had to let uh, kind of let some go and that's one that uh, maybe somebody else could do something with uh, mm -hmm. and um, you know use it and bake something with it we we're we're we moved on to a front porch farm stand which has taken up uh, almost uh, all our time so that that when you when you're busy like that something has to be cut so mm -hmm. we don't do it as much. Right. You mentioned uh, getting wood from construction jobs and such. Uh, somebody asked, what other city resources you've been able to repurpose? And, and I don't know if you have some examples of other things you've been able to put to creative use. Uh, the city resources, I mean, like just from the government or from uh, just anything that we get around here? No, we, just the other things that you found in the city, that you know, oh. the things that were waste or trash or whatever that you were okay. able to repurpose. <laughs> Okay, well, you want the want the you want the, the truth, the skinny on everything is uh, our whole house is secondhand stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, we find we find uh, people changing uh, furniture like you know this is going out of style, so they put the mm -hmm. they put it out on the on the on the curbside, mm -hmm. and uh, the, some of them say you know come and get it free, and and uh, some other people have um, you know moved, and uh, they don't want to carry this stuff. So all, almost all our house has uh, been uh, for, uh, furnished with secondhand. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we use that. We also recycle. We've uh, gotten r rocks from the uh, from the local um, stream. We've gotten uh, uh, certainly a lot of bottles from the restaurants that that uh, they want to throw it away, and we we use the bottles for edging. And and uh, we've gotten mulch from tree trimmers. Mm -hmm. uh, we've gotten uh, the only thing we can't get water. I don't, I don't from the sky. I can't get water. No, we get we we don't like anything to go. Um, of to waste, so we by we use secondhand clothes. We we uh, po uh, go to the Salvation Army to uh, to repair, you know, to reuse the clothes that people are donating, and and think that's a good good way to live. Um, they my my daughters and son are thrilled to get real good uh, material at and help those thrift stores out. Um, we go to uh, the Habitat for Humanity Restore. Mm -hmm. uh, and we we uh, 
we're regular customers there. <laughs> we just don't. We just will not. Uh, at, just at a. The only thing we, if we have to buy something new, uh, and that's the only way to get it, like a computer or something, mm -hmm. um, but uh, or a frig refrigerator. But then we buy energy. Uh, we we use Energy Star, and the city of Pasadena is very progressive, so they give rebates. I mean, one time I was like Mr. Rebate of they would they would get a five calls a year for rebate. I would rebate my television, my washing machine, my toilet, uh, my refrigerator, and then we got the rebate on the solar panels from Pasadena. Mm -hmm. And uh, Pasadena used us on a, a LEED certified, uh, we were the only residents on a LEED certified tour, the first tour they came in with uh, big buses, tour buses from like uh, you see overseas. They came in and we had what people have, you know, kind of thought it was in books, but they saw it on the ground. You know, the pictures. They walked by it. They said, "Oh, look at look at what you're using." <laughs> you know, you just so it's just it's just uh, it's just something that I think I get from my parents that that our future shouldn't be uh, you know wasted on on new things. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and then there's new things, and then new things. We just try to keep the old um, things as far, as long as possible. And we uh, we you know my son uh, works on bicycles, and he and he. Uh, takes parts from one bicycle to make another bicycle work and and um he has a little thing here at the on the neighborhood that the bike bike people come to him and they say you have a patch you have a tire inner tube you have a, have a handlebar you have a seat and and we recycle the bikes that way right. that's great yeah it's one of those uh things that you know Americans were were mm. well known for very good at even 50 years ago that exactly. uh, prosperity has um I wouldn't say bread out of this, but nearly uh, it seems. So. That's really good. Prosperity, I know, and it, but it was was a blessing, and it's almost like a curse, you know. Right. Yeah. Indeed. Um, again, another question on your, um, you know, energy conservation and water conservation uh, with your outdoor uh, shower. Um, they were wondering if the the black hot water coil on the top <laughs> is, is that is that what that is? Is just a yeah. heating yeah, heating coil? Yes, uh, water from the ground here is very cold, <laughs> so because it gets uh, it gets uh, insulated by the ground, mm -hmm. and uh, even though I built it for the for outdoors uh, in the summer, that there was really a chill. <laughs> so my, my my kids would say, and for me too, I said, I'm so used to bathtub water. Uh, what what is this? Uh, you know, natural temperature water. Well, it was cold, so I I got a rubber hose and uh, and the sun. It's um, low tech uh, solar. Mm -hmm. solar heated water <laughs> and right. so it, it does it just enough to to take the edge off of it and we mix it so that they get a tep uh, you know uh, lukewarm uh, mm -hmm. ba uh, shower that's great I, I love the, <laughs> the creative the creative <laughs> adaptation to uh, I honestly uh, uh, so much of what you've done is really uh, harness uh, uh, resources but especially energy mm -hmm. uh, what most people don't realize is that um, growing food growing plants and, and crops uh, is is the ultimate um, energy production uh, process. It oh. takes energy from the sun and turns it into food, which is an energy source for us. So um, you, you've done that on, on, a, on a very hyper-intensive scale in a small space, and which is why everybody thinks it's so so fantastic. But you know, a lot of people do backyard gardens but not do the other stuff you've done. It's great to see you have a really holistic uh, approach to yeah. Not only energy conservation, but energy production and, mm. and energy capturing, which is really, I think, a lot of what you've done in a very efficient manner. So it's great. Yeah, our conservation is. I mean, people want to do a solar, but they don't want to conserve. Mm -hmm. So, so the the man in the city. If I have time to say this, but this is a funny, funny anecdote. The the man that sold us, uh, the city manager that sold us on the idea of solar. He said people are coming to them, um, him, the office of the city, and complaining that their their bills are getting higher even with solar. And he, he said he couldn't believe it. He says, well, turn off some of your stuff. <laughs> right. they, they thought it was a free, free ride. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that now they don't have to, now they have to conserve. But when you have solar energy, then you should conserve even more because then you don't have, you've got, you know, both sides working. Right. Right. Well, and, and if you're trying to be largely off grid in terms of not having to supplement much, um, most people don't realize how much energy they're actually using and, and what it takes with a solar system and batteries to be able to supply that is, is really untenable for most people's budgets. So um, 
you know, the, the, like you said, they they want their they want to eat their cake and eat it too, so so to speak. They want to have, you know, solar so that they're green, quote unquote. But then they don't want to cut back on their usage. So, um, it is really a change in lifestyle, like you mentioned. I think. Um, have a uh, somebody asked about just in terms of your your market gardening um, sales. What's your best selling produce, or maybe types of produce? What what works best for us is greens. Oh, yeah. Uh, salad greens and just greens. They people can't get enough of the fresh greens, heirloom vegetables and the tomatoes and peppers and stuff that, that people have never seen or uh, they don't carry in the markets. Uh, so we are able to um, find a niche. So I would say I would say that um, that our number one seller from the very beginning was just our salads. Yeah, you know, we make a we make a uh, a very uh, healthy a dynamic uh, salad mix that people can't get enough of. So that's what we're known for, but we, and we can get that most of the year, except for now. But uh, when we can, we do we do these unusual vegetables that that um, that um, that you know people will buy and pay 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 better for them. We can't do you know average stuff. We have to get a, a specialty, you mm -hmm. know, because there's not there's no not not enough space, not enough acreage to do it. So we for little space we 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 grow pricey vegetables. <laughs> that's all. That's how we make a living at our, uh, in the city, because uh, especially Pasadena, uh, that's how we um, can do that. They we can't compete with the big boys. Right, and and local, uh, I think it really lends your competitive advantage is in things that are the most perishable, which greens tend to be. So that uh, makes sense. If people are interested in doing market gardening and uh, you know taking your access to market with that kind of an arrangement, I'd encourage you. Um, to uh, listen to the webinar we had uh, a month or so ago with the Roberts brothers from Texas, who that's their their focus is market gardening, um, and then also the, uh, some great books um, that were mentioned in that webinar. But if you, you read uh, Elliot Coleman, um, his uh, his focus is a little bit larger scale than what uh, the Devas is doing, but he talks about um, kind of how to approach your market and how to pick what niche products you're going to to grow. He actually grows um, in the winter in Maine using greenhouses and cold frames. So he basically grows off season to maximize his profit margin, which is really uh, creative and, and a, I think a fantastic approach. Um, and especially if you've got limited space, if you can either do things that uh, based on competitive advantage through uh, freshness like you're doing, or if you're in a, an area that has a more seasonality like in the east or the north, if you can grow off season, especially using uh, season extension type things, that's a great way to uh, to go about it. So. Um, I'd highly encourage anybody who's thinking about doing that to, to pursue it because we need more people growing food uh, themselves and taking it to market and, and building up the local food economy uh, rather than just saying, oh, well, I want to buy organic and I'll go to Walmart to get it. <laughs> that's, that's not going to solve the problem. Uh, real quick question about your beekeeping. Uh, you uh, since you, you're in an Africanized bee uh, affected area, have you had any issues with your hives? Yes, um, that I know that applies only to this area here in California, but that's a real serious problem. I don't think people have gotten the the uh, you know down, understood the seriousness of this down here. Um, Africanized bees are really uh, to me they're just uh, pests, and I know people want to get save bees. Uh, they want to, um, you know, um, f figure that they're trying to uh, environmental solution. But what happens is that bees uh, are going to breed the aggressively, the aggressive drone uh, mates with the queen. And uh, no matter what we've done, we started with um, hives that were gentle, but over the years they turn African. As the queen gets older and the new queen comes on, uh, generally, it's uh, I would say um, on probably uh, almost a sure thing it's going to get meaner, and and then when you have you have neighbors uh, and you have people that are afraid of bees, and then I had I had a hive here that was so so aggressive that it would chase us. Now, I've been a beekeeper for since the 70s, and I've never seen um, how the bees have turned almost like wasps, and they mm -hmm. they're they're uh, they're not it's not a pleasant thing. Uh, I'm, I'm in favor of saving the bees, but Santa Monica here in, in uh, California, uh, they had that they had that problem go before the city council, and they people wanted to have backyard bees, but they said, uh, you know, I'm listening to some beekeepers they who know about this. They said, well, 
we can have you can have backyard bee, bees, but you have to requeen them every year. Mm-hmm. That guarantees you you have to put in a gentle queen, because over the over the years it's just going to turn. On my experience here, I thought, you know, if I watched over them, you know, but bees do their do the things for four miles, you know, do their own business for four miles or so. So you can't you can't predict um, uh, heredity or gen- genetics there, but just know that the African bee is so is so aggressive they probably they probably beat out all the other traits. Uh, the the mean mean gene uh, is dominant. So mm-hmm. I I just I, you know I would say that would be the last thing I would do. Now looking back on it, when people asked would you do beekeeping, I said it's been such a hassle, especially with swarms. Uh, even no matter what you do, they swarm faster than uh, because they were bred to be African. Uh, they swarm to protect themselves. They're, they swarm because this in and they swarm on a, at a moment's notice because they're they were bred in in that climate. Um, whereas the gentle bee would be an, an Italian bee, which basically likes to sit home and, and just do, do uh, honey producing and, and uh, stay put. But mm-hmm. uh, the swarming in this area where, where um, old buildings and old trees and, and, um, and people uh, that are, you know, allergic to the, it just was too, it was too hard to contemplate all the, the dangers that would be uh, involved in it. So we're just, Low keying on on a, a couple hives and and uh, making sure that we get a, a good queen in there all the time and just uh, maybe three months ago uh, I told my son uh, you know that that hive is so so vicious you uh, you have to you have to destroy it because mm-hmm. nobody nobody could stop the bees from pestering and I I don't want to I'm not interested in, in uh, you know bees over people <laughs> so I have to so I have, I have to you know we the beekeeping operation was to have bees and, and people and make it a nice uh you know symbiotic whatever relation but it was not it was not to be with africans mm-hmm. yeah. that's uh i can't i can't yeah i can't do anything i mean i i would love to try to do it but it um you can't work them they won't mm-hmm. they're not they're not uh they're not workable so that's just like uh you know that got scary that i couldn't i couldn't even approach them and i'm calm <laughs> they did, right. they just wouldn't they were you know it's supposed to be there hyperactive when somebody when a dog or something knocks them over but it didn't matter i was calm with them and i've been uh, stung so many times i can i can take it but they wouldn't they wouldn't uh, relinquish uh, the the attack you know they would uh uh they just kept attacking and attacking and so i said I, you, you can't keep them in the city mm-hmm. and how, so how many hives do you have currently uh we have two here you. Okay. And so, uh, did you replace the one that you got rid of with a new one, or did you, were you at three and then you had to? Well, we, we yeah, we moved them down to a neighbor's, uh, mm-hmm. and and that place has two, and okay. um, and they're all you know all um, kind of the docile kind, but the other one was so aggressive it it actually chased me from two doors down down to my place here. It chased my son really, and then it got to me too. And I told him, hey, that's no you know that's no good for the neighborhood. You gotta got to get rid of that one right and so now that one's down that now there are two over there so it was two here and two there but it was three over there until the until we found out what one was just not gonna uh, you know be good for the city that's all mm-hmm. right well um i think we are about done i don't know if we have any more questions Does anybody have any other questions they'd like to ask before we wrap up um one person asked do you have any container garden uh container gardens in the house in the winter, I'm guessing that you probably have tempered enough that you can uh, do most of your stuff outside. Do you, do you have any that you have inside or in a, in a covered uh, area during the wintertime? Yeah, I would, I would say we, got them, we would get them closer to the house. We don't necessarily mm-hmm. need to have them um, out there, but we've gotten some severe winters here, so um, we try to keep them uh, on the sunny side. You know, we have mo- mobile mm-hmm. Uh, we can mo- move them around. They're mobile, so we mo- move them to that would have been out in the open and be um, sub- subject to freeze. We move them closer to the house mm-hmm. and to the sunny side. Right. Yeah, we, containers have, are very important. Yeah. Do you, Do you have any? Uh, do you do you grow any citrus? Yes, we had. Uh, we have um, oranges, lemons, um, kumquats, avocado. Oh, citrusy talking about. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, let's see. Well, we had some grapefruit, but we have we have we're having some difficulties here mm-hmm. with with uh, some disease. We have a leaf miner that they've never a citrus leaf miner that never come uh, they've never seen here west attack the citrus, and then we've had a 
uh, greening disease that they've quarantined uh, citrus tr transportation because there's the the growth the people who have the big money invested they're afraid it's already here now it was uh, it was expected to come but it came just about half a year ago they caught uh, uh, the cil ciliad, ciliad that was transporting the greening disease and it's it, it's irreversible so they're really scared and so they they're trying to hold the fort here but they're uh, they're thinking of spraying the, the plant if they're, if they're infected and, and dousing the ground with chemicals. I mm -hmm. said, well, in that case, we'll remove the. In that case, we'll just sacrifice the tree. We we don't want, right. you know, we don't want to live that way. <laughs> so we won't yeah. get citrus that way. Mm -hmm. That's unfortunate, but that's that's the reality here. Yeah. Um, one uh, last question about uh, water usage. What? Do you, how many uh, gallons of water do you use uh, annually? Do we have a, a map of the, um, the uses of water? You never put it out? A graph? Uh, we have, just a rough estimate. Maybe. Yeah, we have a graph, but I, I tell you what, we, we have, it's on our website, but we, mm -hmm. we, our, our water bill is um, a, annually, right? $600 annually. Wow. $600 annually. What does that equate to in gallons, or maybe what's your monthly? Uh, yeah, I have to see what the price per gallon is. Um, yeah. You know, because because they charge more and for different mm -hmm. tiers and uh, levels that they use. So I'm not really sure. I haven't. My son takes mm -hmm. care of that, but we do have a uh, on uh, we do have a a graph of water usage. Mm -hmm. And maybe if you can here, if you can, uh, if somebody's interested, we'll find out the cost of the get per gallon. But uh, we're in the Southern California, so they they to, for all these people, they have to have they have to offer cheap water because mm -hmm. you know there's just there's. Uh, too many people here, so mm -hmm. yeah, the water is pretty, uh, uh, you know, cheap here. But it's it's not good that it comes from. So we're dependent on, on the. Uh, so they're looking now to uh, harvest other waters some from other sources. But mm -hmm. yeah, I would say yeah, well, we're 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 trying trying to figure out a solution that would be uh, more like, um, you know, uh, asking uh, for the creator for rain. You know, right. <laughs> I will. Uh, I'll take a look and see if I can find that on the website, and then I'll post a link to that on the uh, on the resource see what the page. Price, that, what are we paying? I'm sorry. I'm just talking out. See what we're paying sure. for the gallon. Okay. Go ahead. Great. Well, if we uh, if we don't have any um, follow-on questions, uh, we uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up for the night. Uh, Jules, thank you so much for coming on with us tonight and sharing all of your wealth of, um, of experience and knowledge and uh, all that you've done. We uh, we appreciate the hard work you've done to kind of trailblaze in this area of uh, micro farming and, and urban farming uh, and the urban homesteading movement. And uh, thank you for the the uh, inspiration that you've given to so many people. Thank Thanks you so much thank for coming you. on. Yeah, thank you for your compliments and I enjoyed it and, and uh, good luck with your work. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, just want to mention one last thing uh, for those who were on with us two weeks ago uh, for our last webinar with Kristen Canty. Um, we had a special uh, offer on her uh, Farmageddon uh, DVD, and uh, it was 20% off your entire order using the code Farmageddon at checkout. We've extended that through tonight. Uh, actually, probably I'll extend it through tomorrow night. So if anybody's interested, uh, you get 20% off your order, and any uh, orders that are over $75 will get the movie for free just as a thank you. So thanks for um, your support of the webinar series and uh, for what you're doing. Uh, thank you for uh, Jules coming out tonight and sharing with us. And um, if anybody has any uh, follow-on questions, you can stay on after we stop the uh, recording, and we can uh, keep the chat window open. Thanks everybody for coming on tonight, and appreciate your time. Have a great night, everybody.